Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about principal component analysis. If you ask me, principal component analysis is one of the most interesting and, of course, complex techniques when it comes to machine learning. It falls under the category of unsupervised learning. We'll talk about principal component analysis as usual in our best intuitive way. But before we move any further, in case you've not already subscribed to our channel, I think it's the right time to do so and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive updates. Also, feel free to share this with your friends who might find it useful. Let's get started. Before we get into principal component analysis, we'll have to get our intuition right for correlations. So a correlation captures the degree and direction of association between two variables. In this picture, if you see, we have a variable called x1 and we have a variable y. Let's say x1 is the explanatory variable and y is the response variable or an outcome of interest. We are interested in y, but we want to figure out y through x's. In this case, if you see, as we move in the positive direction of x-axis, we see that the values of y are also increasing. So in these cases, as the x increases and the y also increases corresponding to an increase in x, it is called a positive correlation. Whereas in cases where x increases, but as a result of increase in x, y decreases, it's called a negative correlation. Correlation would always be between minus one and plus one. The closer to one it is, the stronger is the magnitude or the strength of the relationship between the two variables. We understand what is correlation, but do we treat it differently when we talk about correlation between y and x versus two independent variables? These are two different x's. The fact is that we are always very happy to see a correlation between an outcome of interest and an explanatory variable or independent variable but we are often not that happy when we see two independent variables correlated. Now, why is that so? Let's try to understand that. Let's say Y is an outcome of interest, so you want to predict the duration of employment of an employee in a company. Let's say it's in months. Now, one of the explanatory variables there is annual salary. The higher the salary, maybe it would lead to a higher tenure of the employee in the company. So let's say the management tells you that don't just rely on one variable. We have a lot of information about employees. Why don't you collect other variables? In this case, what will be your preferred choice as the second variable? Options are, let's say the second variable is monthly salary. Will that be a good variable versus the second variable could be any of these prior experience, education, performance ratings, employee satisfaction scores, what would be your choice in this case? A or any of the choices given under B? Well, I think you already have a bit of intuition behind us. Annual salary and monthly salary in most cases will actually be related. In fact, monthly salary multiplied by 12 for 12 months plus minus some adjustments for bonus and taxes would actually determine the annual salary. So by adding monthly salary, probably we will not be adding any additional explanatory power to our model. It is no new information that we're getting by adding a variable called monthly salary when we already have the annual salary available. Now, in this case, it is very intuitive, very straightforward that we see annual salary and monthly salary are, of course, related. However, you may not find the relationship so direct, but your subject matter expertise, your understanding of the area tells you that the variables can be related. For example, age, experience and salary. Experience in years is actually a subset of a person's age, right? If a person continues to work over the years, as the age grows, the experience is also growing. Now, while hiring, most of the recruitment agencies would consider your past experience in years, and that is one of the important predictors of your salary. So in this case, again, you would see that probably these three variables, though they capture three different pieces of information, they are actually correlated. In such cases, again, you will not be adding any additional explanatory power to your models if you add all these three variables. So you may want to decide 
how do you want to proceed further? Because end of the day, you want a good model. You want to be able to predict tenure of an employee with great accuracy. So the important takeaway is if we add redundant variables, it won't help us improve our model. Once again, we are happy to have our outcome of interest or the dependent variable being correlated with our independent variables, but we do not want our independent variables to be correlated with each other. So how do we proceed in this case? Let's understand. We talk about principal component analysis as a dimension reduction technique. And often people think of dimension reduction as if it's just simply dropping the variables. Let's say something like this, but it actually is not the case. You don't just simply drop a variable in principal component analysis. Instead, you do this. So let's say we had three original variables, x1, x2, and x3. Principal components are a combination of these variables. So in a principal component one, you see a trace of x1, x2, and x3. And so is the case with principal component two and principal component three. And to put it in mathematical terms, it is something like this. So each principal component is a linear combination of the observed variables. So you can write PC1 as A1, X1, A2, X2, and A3, X3. X1, X2, X3 are your variables, and A1, A2, A3 are coefficients. So is the case with Bs and Cs. An important rule is that the number of principal components that you can extract will always be the same as the number of variables. But then the question arises, if we are going to work with the same number of principal components, then where is the dimension reduction happening? How are we reducing the variables? We started with the notion that we probably want to get rid of a few variables, but here we are saying that we will get a linear combination of the observed variables. Well, we actually do dimension reduction, but that's done after we extract the principal components. And let's understand this a little better on what basis we can do dimension reduction. So let's say you're referring to an example of a tennis ball. Inside a tennis ball, if let's say you're at the center and you have to make it to the surface and assume that this is a no gravity situation, it does not matter in which direction you go because every direction is equal. You have to travel the distance equal to the radius from the center to be able to make it to the surface. So all the directions are one and the same for you. Versus that, if you have a scenario of a rugby ball, in this case, you would agree that the dimensions are not the same. So you capture a larger spread of the data if you go in the direction of principal component one, which is the larger axis. And you travel relatively lesser distance in the direction of principal component two. By design, principal components are always orthogonal to each other. See, we started with the idea that the variables were correlated and that's where we wanted to do principal components analysis. Now, if the principal components also happen to be correlated, then there is no point doing principal component analysis. So by design, the principal components are always orthogonal to each other. And the beauty is that principal components are always extracted in the descending order of importance. We call it eigenvalue. And just in a few seconds, we'll discuss that. So we have two scenarios, one where it doesn't matter in which direction we are going, Second, where there are directions where there is a preference. So I will cover a larger spread of the rugby ball in the direction of PC1 and then maybe in the direction of PC2 and subsequently other principal components. And you may want to equate the spread as the information in the data. So basically what we want to do is we want to capture the most important information that's there in the data by eliminating any kind of redundancy that's introduced by the correlations between the variables. Because now when we transform it to principal component one and principal component two, we are certain that there is no correlation. So there is no overlap of information between principal components, which was originally there in the observed variables. A bit of terminology that we want to be comfortable with we always talk about eigenvectors when we talk about principal components. Eigenvector is nothing but the direction of the principal components. And you could see in the previous example, we had a certain direction in which the principal component one and principal component two were pointing. They'll always have their respective eigenvectors, nothing but a representation of the direction. 
But how do we decide which principal component is more important? Because till the time we are not able to relatively give an importance to principal components, we will not be able to achieve dimension reduction. So in order to be able to do so, let's start with an example. Let's say there are four partners and they have a business idea. And they've done their estimates. They know that they need an initial capital investment of $4 million. Now what happens is, of course, if they want equal rights in the business in terms of their time contribution, in terms of their gains, everything, then they have to divide their contribution evenly. So it is expected that every partner will contribute 1 million to the business and that will make their capital 4 million to start with. However, it is observed when the time comes, actually not everybody contributes as it was originally agreed. So there is partner A who contributed 1.8, million, partner B, which contributed 1.2 million, partner C contributed only a 0.6 million and partner D contributed only a 0.4 million. So we see that partner one is compliant, partner two is compliant, but partner three and partner four probably are not on track. We can simply convert their contributions to proportions and percentages. Now, in order to do this, we just have to divide their contribution by the total. So you will see the proportion of contribution from partner one is 45%, whereas partner two is contributing 30%, partner three and partner four are contributing 15% and 10% respectively. We can also estimate the cumulative percentage, which will be a total starting from the base. Now, if you've understood this much by far, you've understood a very important concept known as eigenvalues. What are eigenvalues? Eigenvalues represent the unit of spread captured by each principal components. In our case, the eigenvalues were the contributions given by each partner. Assumption was that every partner will contribute equally. Likewise, in principal component analysis, the assumption is that every principal component will contribute equally. But we observed that there are some principal components which contribute relatively higher, and there are some principal components that contribute lesser. Principal component analysis extracts these principal components in the descending order of eigenvalues. So in our case, the partner one, if you see, had the highest contribution, 45%. When we look at partner two, she had a contribution of 30%. Together, they had a contribution of 75%. And if we take partner one, two, and three, we have a total of 90% contribution. Same way, in case of principal component analysis, you can imagine that you look at the principal components which are relatively more important. So if I only manage these first two partners in this case, we will still be able to capture 75% of the spread or information in our data. So you would not be applying principal component analysis on three or four variables. This is just to give you an intuition. You may be dealing with the data which comes with say 90 odd columns. And with the help of principal component analysis, you might be able to compress it to maybe 15 to 20 columns. And that's where principal component analysis becomes very relevant and important. So whenever you use a tool like Python or R, which are the popular tools in data science, you would typically be able to extract the coefficients. These coefficients are these A1, A2s, and A3s. So on for the principal component two and three. So the tools will help you extract the coefficients and their signs will represent the direction. Let's now take an example and try to interpret the output of principal component analysis. Here, let's say we have taken three variables. First is the fat cholesterol, LDL, and we have the readings for that. Second is hypertension and third is glucose. And we have a lot of data. I'm just showing you some initial snapshot of the data, let's say. Now, let's say when you apply principal component analysis on this data, you come up with a result where principal component one and principal component two together contribute more than 90%. It's like those two partners which are most important, right? So in this case, when you perform this on a tool, it comes up with the coefficients. Now, together with the variables and the coefficients, you can derive the principal components. We saw that principal component is nothing but a linear combination of the variables and the coefficients. So let's say hypothetically, you got these coefficients. For PC1, you got the coefficient of LDL as 0.9, hypertension is 0.75, and glucose as negative 0.25. And for PC2, let's say you got separate coefficients. These are your B1s, B2s, and B3s. Let's say this is 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.
0.06 and 0.93 respectively. How do you derive the principal component values now? Well, you simply have to apply these equations here, right? So you have to put the values in this order. I'm showing you the first example. So you will take 0.9 and you will take the first value of the variable, which is 169 here. Then 0.75 multiplied by 185, which is the second variable that you have. And then negative 0.25 multiplied by 143. So you finally get this value as 255. So you see that those three columns have been compressed to this one column for PC1. And what would be the case for PC2? For PC2, you will say that these are the coefficients. So I just have to put these values. So 0.1 times 169, which is my first column, first row, 0.06 times 185, which is my second column first row, and 0.93 times 143, exactly the same way. So you, what you get is an equivalent. So now you will do this for every single row in your data. And finally, what you will be looking at is something like this. So now you can see you started with three columns, but finally you have only two columns. You've been able to reduce one dimension. This is just an example. And we're doing this to build the intuition around principal component analysis. As stated, we typically apply it on much larger data. It's not about just dropping the columns. It's about deriving new features out of the available ones in such a way that you're still able to capture the information that's there. Without losing much of information or the spread of the data, you are wisely compressing the data. How does it help? Well, it eliminates all the redundancy from the model. Otherwise, you keep collecting and working with the kind of variables that don't really add much value. Now, there are certain prerequisites for performing principal competence analysis. First is that your independent variables should be correlated. Only then a principal competence analysis is meaningful. Second is that your data should be continuous. The variables which are being subjected to principal competence analysis should be continuous. If you have a mix of columns, let's say uh, the variables which are continuous and categorical, you can apply principal component analysis only on the continuous variables, leaving the categorical variables aside. There are different methods to deal with the categorical data, but that's a little out of scope for us right now. Third is the data should be free from outliers. Uh, why outliers matter? When you look at the formula for correlations. If you see the formula for correlation, you'll realize that it uses averages, and averages are not meaningful when you have extreme values in your data. Your variables should be on the same scale. If you have variables on different scales, let's say there is a variable which is in units, and there's another variable which is in hundreds of thousands, it will make a difference when it comes to results. So variables should be on the same scale. The example that we took, uh, coincidentally, we had the variables more or less on the same scale, so we could proceed. Otherwise, there are techniques to scale the data and proceed with the principal component analysis. So with this, we come to an end of this session. If you've not already subscribed to this channel, I would strongly recommend you do that right now and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive the updates. And once again, share this with your friends and colleagues who may be interested in this topic and have found this complicated otherwise. I can assure you sharing of knowledge always helps in its growth. Thank you.